now that we're going to talk about as per our our schedule is the the yoga sutras but ultimately our goal in in this retreat ultimately our goal in general but especially especially in the retreat is that you should be inspired that you should be uplifted that you should be able to, as we were speaking last night, peel back layers of the self to connect with the truth of who you are. Because that's where the light is. The light, when we talk about enlightenment, is never a light that's coming from outside. It's always a light that's within, but that we're unable to see because metaphorically our curtains are drawn or metaphorically our window is dirty. And so that that flows through the lectures as well. My goal is not to give you lots of sutras to memorize or lots of Sanskrit terms to memorize. There will be some and we'll weave them in, but ultimately This is not a class that you're going to have to take an exam on. Those of you who do yoga teacher's training, whether you do it here, whether you do it somewhere else, you do have to memorize it. You do have to take an exam and remember it and pass it. But for this retreat, all you have to do is be inspired. All you have to do is take in that which can change you so that when you walk into 2018, your experience of yourself is different. And so I mention that because even though this is a very hard philosophy type of topic, don't think about it like that and I'm not going to do it like that. Our goal with this, as our goal with everything is... What does it mean to you? How does it impact you? Yes, how does it impact you? So with that, the the word sutra literally means a thread. In English, we talk about getting sutures. If you if you fall and you hurt yourself and you have to get stitches, the stitches are called sutures. That's the more medical term. Colloquially, we say stitches. The medical term is sutures. It's the same same concept. A thread that is weaving together. In the case of a suture, it's weaving together your skin. It's weaving together two sides of a wound. In the Yoga Sutras... It's weaving together our lives. And that's, that's what the yoga sutras are about. There's no sutra. We're not going to get through very many of them today. We'll get through as many as we can. But there's none of them. None of them. Even if we did this for the next week and we went through every sutra, there's not one sutra that says, here's how flat your palms have to be on the ground in this pose, or here's how long you have to stand on your head, or here's what your leg must look like in this posture. We have other texts on that. We have a wealth of study on the asanas. But the sutras, that which truly weaves us together, is something much deeper than just the physical postures of our body. So it's said that after God, in the form of Lord Vishnu, 
that after he had incarnated as Danvantri, who is the, the god of health, the god who gave us Ayurveda, that after that, after getting Ayurveda and people becoming physically healthy, that still there was unhealth in the minds. There was unhealth in the hearts. And so Lord Vishnu was again beseeched to incarnate on earth in a form that would give us not just what Ayurveda gave us for health of the body, but something that would bring us health of the mind, health of the heart, health of the spirit, health internally. And so it said he incarnated as the sage Patanjali, who gave us the Yoga Sutras. So that was the, that's the foundation of how these sutras came in. And the, the sutras begin, I'm going to, we'll start with this and we'll weave our way in and out of different sutras. But they begin by saying, at yog anushasanam, at yog anushasanam. Now, for the discipline of yoga. That's what it means. That's what the first sutra means. Now, we are delving together. The verb is just understood. Into the, the discipline of yoga. And this is important because yoga is a discipline. And ultimately, it takes us into samadhi. We're going to move into the eight limbs. But in order to get there, it's a discipline. These days when there's so many different types of yoga all over the world, and there's, you know, acrobatics yoga, and there's swimming yoga, and there's hula hoops yoga, and there's yoga with my dog, and yoga with my cat, and yoga with my goats, and yoga. I mean, there's, there's so many Yoga to music, yoga to me. It's important to remember that regardless of what you're listening to while you're doing yoga, regardless of whether the other members in your class are human beings or a variety of different animals or whatever the situation in which you might be doing your asana practice, yoga is a discipline. Doesn't mean you can't be disciplined while listening to music. Doesn't mean you can't be disciplined with dogs or goats or cats roaming around. But it means that my yoga is a discipline. And if I lose that, I've lost everything. And this is true not just in my practice on the mat. But yoga is actually my life. You know, we always say yoga is a noun, it's not a verb. It's who you are, not just what you're doing. It's not, it's not a doing, it's a being. And so the discipline of yoga, it's not just about thou shalt be disciplined to keep thy legs straight in trikonasana. That's not, that's not the highest level of discipline we're talking about. It's a discipline of the self. And this is why when Patanjali gave us the eight limbs of yoga, he didn't begin with trikonasana or any asana. He began with the yamas and the niyamas, the disciplines of life. How we are internally, our internal discipline, and how we are with those in the world. And while I don't want to take the entire hour to talk about the eight limbs. When speaking about the Yoga Sutras, this is really very, very core. So I want to talk about it briefly. Because a lot of us think that yoga is just the third limb. The third limb is asana. Maybe, maybe we think it also includes pranayam, the fourth limb. But we actually begin with yama, or yam, as is actually pronounced properly in Sanskrit, and niyam. As we 
bring everything into English, we call them the yamas and the niyamas, but that's just sort of an English Sanskrit mix. It's yam and niyam. And what these are is how we live in the world. And they have nothing to do with the straightness of our legs. They have nothing to do with the flexibility of our spine. And everything to do with the straightness of our morals, our values. And everything to do with the flexibility of our egos. So they begin, they begin with ahimsa, which is nonviolence. Satyam, which is truthfulness. Asteya, non-stealing. Brahmacharya, which is restraint, restraint of the senses. It's not always specifically just sexual abstinency. It's a broader concept of general discipline and restraint. And then apigraha, which is non-hoarding, non-covetousness. So again, without going into incredible depth of all of these, if we simply look at them as a whole, what we realize is this is how we move in the world. But it's not just my interaction with others. It comes from a place within. I can't not steal or not covet or not hoard until and unless I have an experience within of fullness. I might sit on my hands and, you know, prevent myself from actually stealing your pretty handbag or your nice shawl that I want or your diamond necklace or your husband or your, you know, what, whatever it is that I might be coveting. I could forcibly prevent myself from doing that. But that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is something deeper. And so in order to not steal, not covet, not hoard, I have to no longer be moving through the world with an experience of emptiness or an experience of scarcity. Because if I'm less than in any way, naturally I'm going to want more. I'm going to need more. Whether I need more money or I need more clothes or I need more respect or I need more love or I need more approval, whatever it is, I'm going to need that. And then I'm going to have to figure out some way to, to get it. And whether it's through lying, whether it's through stealing, Whatever it is, I need it because I'm having an experience of emptiness. I've got an experience of scarcity. If, if we move through the world with this myth of a limited amount, whether it's a limited amount of success, a limited amount of happiness, a limited amount of love. Now, we all know intuitively that, of course, that doesn't make any sense. Of course, there's an infinite amount of happiness possible in the world. Of course, there's an infinite amount of success possible in the world. Not in one, you know, company. Not everybody can be CEO of the exact same company or president of the exact same company. But in general, there's an infinite amount of possible success. And yet on a deep level, a lot of us don't believe that. And the reason that we know we don't believe that is the way that we begrudge each other happiness and success. If you're really honest with yourself, really honest, you don't have to share this with anybody else, but just take a moment and think back on times when people you know, even friends of yours, got a fantastic raise, got a fantastic promotion, fell in love, got married, had a child, whatever it was, had these things that are just fantastic, beautiful landmarks of success, of happiness, you know, built themselves a new house that they'd wanted to build. While, while we're happy for them because we love them, much too frequently there's, there's a little bit inside that would begrudge them that. And if they lose it, 
although although we're sad for them because we love them and they're our friends, there's a little bit too much of a place within us that that smiles. And that that horrendousness of the self, if we're really honest and, and look at it within us, it's not because we're horrible people. It's not because we're mean people. It's because we're operating under this cultural concept of scarcity, which means, oh my God, you've just gotten something wonderful. That means there's less of the pie for me to get something wonderful. And if, if you've lost that wonderful thing, ah, there's more of the pie now. Like there's more, ba- the jackpot's gotten bigger now. There's more in the pot. And so as long as I'm moving through the world with any kind of a, a vision of scarcity in the universe, any kind of sense of lack within myself, I'm going to be stealing on some level, whether I'm snatching somebody's handbag or jewelry or whether I'm simply stealing people's time and resources to force people to listen to you gossip, to force people to listen to you complain or judge other people or tell, you know, negative stories about other people, is stealing their time. It's stealing their their peace. To force people to do things that aren't meaningful is stealing their time. To force them to do something against their own values is stealing them from their se- themselves. So much of the way that we shop, so much of the way that we eat, so much of what we wear, while we may not be stealing it from the store, we think, I paid for that. What's the problem? I walked up to the cashier. I gave my money. I got it legitimately. But the production of that item, in order to satisfy our constant clamoring for more and more and more, cheaper and cheaper, Well, this is where sweatshops come in. This is where child labor comes in. And so even though I paid the $8 that was on the price tag of the new sweater that I got on sale, was the real price only $8? In order to give it to me for only $8, did I steal some child's childhood? Did I steal some woman's health? Did I steal something from the earth because the factory, in order to provide things so cheaply, the factory has to not put in proper waste management? And so the waste from that factory is polluting the soil, polluting the water, such that I'm stealing the health of people who live in that city? So this is where we start to understand the depth of the discipline that yoga is. And the depth of what is required of us to be on a yogic path. But the beautiful thing to always keep keep in mind is that ultimately, even though while practicing these individually, so I had a craving for a steak, but I'm practicing ahimsa. Therefore, I'm not going to engage in eating non-vegetarian food because it's not only violent to the animals, but it's violent to the earth. It's violent to the starving children from whose hands I'm stealing, stealing the food. It's violent to the farmers whose fields are desiccated because of the water that animal agriculture requires. So I'm practicing ahimsa. I'm practicing asteya non-stealing. So I I didn't eat the meat. But on some level, maybe, maybe I'm feeling really like I've sacrificed something. So I'm longing for it. I'm not super happy. I've done it. 
I feel good about the fact that I've done it, but nonetheless, there's a part of me thinking, oh, that steak would have tasted so good. I'm giving up so much. This is where it's important to always remember, regardless of what limb we're focusing on at that moment, that the eighth limb is samadhi, which is ecstasy, it's bliss. And it's far, far deeper, far higher bliss than anything that you get from an $8 sweater or a steak or a hamburger or somebody else's diamond necklace or handbag or husband. It's what you get through, through living the discipline of yoga. So we begin, we begin with Yam. And we move into Niyam, which is, again, how we live. And it shifts a little bit more internal. From my purity, I'm not going to go into all of it, but from my purity of my body, of my mind, which of course means, you know, when we think about cleanliness or purity, most of us just think of that as in, I need to make sure to always have a shower before I go to my yoga class. Like that's sort of the extent of when we think about cleanliness and purity. But the, the, the cleanliness and purity that it really refers to is not just of the body before you get on the mat. It's about the mind. You know, Pooja Swamiji always emphasizes that we, we take in junk food. Not just through our mouths. You know, we may say, okay, now I'm doing yoga, so no more sugar, no more white flour, no more this, no more that. I'm going to go vegan. I'm going to go gluten-free. I'm going to go this. I'm going to go that, which is great. But it's a great beginning. The purity is not just that which I'm taking in through my mouth. It's that which I'm taking in through my eyes. It's that which I'm taking in through my ears. It's the TV shows I watch. It's the music I listen to. It's the conversations I take part in. It's all of that. So when we focus on purity, it's really a a purity of the entire self. And remember, for those of you who maybe weren't here last night in the arti, when I was speaking about the yagna ceremony as a, as a purifying ritual, it's not purifying the core of who we are. Who we are at the core is already pure. According to Indian spiritual philosophy, that core, that self, is divine. The Upanishads tell us, Isha vasya midam sardavam, yat kincha jagat yam jagat. And it means everything in the universe, including us, including us. A lot of times we think everything in the universe minus us is is divine, is pure, as though somehow I were the one who got away. Like God's, God's mold of purity broke when it came to me. Yeah, everybody, everybody else is divine. Everybody else is whole. Everybody else is complete. Everybody else is wonderful. I'm a mess. So it's important to remember that in that all, I'm also there. So the core of who we are is pure is divine, is whole, is complete, is all of that. The purification is of that which blocks us from seeing that, blocks us from living that. And then, of course, moving on, picking up some speed as I see our time going, into our last niyam of Ishwar Pranidhan, which is a, a surrender to the divine. And of course, it doesn't mean to the divine in the form of, say, Lord Vishnu, because he's the one who incarnated as Patanjali. Or get, it's not that. It doesn't matter how you conceive of the divine, what religion you come from, what culture you come from. Yoga is not about religion. Yoga is about union with 
the whole. Yoga is about awareness that, so hum, I am that. And so whatever name or form I use to think of that, the capital T that, I surrender to that. This is the, the bowing. And when I surrender to that, it's a surrendering of the ego. You know, yoga teaches us to bend over physically, not just for our hamstrings and our femurs and our hips, but yoga teaches us to bend over for our egos. Yes, our hamstrings benefit, our femurs benefit, our hips benefit, but ultimately, ultimately it's about bending the ego. Surrendering. Because if I don't surrender, I might as well stop my eight limbs right there. I can't go any further. If I don't bend and create space, there is no room for anything else to come in my life. There is no room for me to unite with anyone or anything, which is what yoga is. So after learning yamaniyam, after implementing yamaniyam, only then do we move through the asanas, through pranayam. So what, what, what the eight limbs are doing is taking us from the outermost in terms of our actions in the world, our choices in the world, our behavior in the world, both how I interact with others as well as how I interact with myself, into using the body as a medium, using the body as a medium to experience oneness. And this is important. I'm going to take a moment here, actually, because as we emphasize, which here at Parmarth we emphasize a lot, that Yoga is not just asana. It is really important to emphasize the importance of asana. The, the, the weight of asana tends to be sort of a pendulum swing. Either you're in a class that's all about asana, and yoga is asana, and it's all about how straight your legs are, and it's all about you know how many frog poses you can do, and it's all about that. Or... Asana gets sort of a bad, you know, a bad name as it's, it's just asana. It's, you know, merely asana. And I wanted to just take a moment because these eight limbs are not necessarily sequential. They're not rungs on a ladder. It is possible to enter the river of yoga through any of these limbs as a ghat, even asana. And I mention this only because I have experienced it. Not in my body, but I had the wonderful, wonderful blessing of being in Pune while BKS Iyengarji was still alive and being in the room where he was practicing. He used to go into his his hall where his students were practicing, and he would go in for his few hour a day asana practice. And in order to be in that room, you had to be one of his, you know, advanced pupils from somewhere in the world. So these were all advanced students. I got in because my mother was an advanced student, and I was there visiting her. And... He would do asanas. Now, this was not many years before he passed away. So he was well into his mid to late 80s at this point. And he would come in and he would go into variations of backbend or variations of shoulder stand or variations of setu bandha. So not, not seated asanas, not Padmasana, not Siddhasana, not the type of asanas that people think of as meditative asanas. 
all of his students would, of course, try to keep up because everybody wanted to do what Guruji was doing. So he would get into the back bend. They would all then get into the back bend. Or he would get into the shoulder stand. They would all then get into the shoulder stand. And the room was full of people in their 20s and 30s, advanced students, advanced teachers, who couldn't keep up with him. Couldn't keep up with them. You would see their faces red and sweaty and their hearts beating fast. And his eyes would be closed or very, just kind of half closed. And he'd come out of these postures 20, 30 minutes later. I mean, who's heard of anybody staying in a back bend for half an hour, right? He'd come out and his eyes looked like he had just been in the most intense meditation. He clearly was entering the river of yoga through asana. And it's always really important to me to share that because even though that's not how most of us experience asana, I've certainly never had meditative, ecstatic, samadhi experiences that I, that I experience in seated meditation in an asana, in trikonasana, in a backbend. But I know it's possible because I've seen it happen. And he, of course, emphasized a lot that the, the body was the medium for that. So it's important that when we discuss the eight limbs that we also include the fact that that is actually possible. It's not typically the way most people experience samadhi. But when Iyengarji spoke about how each of these limbs could get you there, he was speaking from the position of a man who actually had experienced that. Um, and then we move on. So we, we begin by using the body. And then we use the breath. And then, as we get ourselves closer and closer and closer into the experience of what yoga really is, we withdraw the senses, right? So we bring our minds from being in a million places to being in one place, single-pointed, focus. And this is crucial. And in fact, actually, the, the second sutra tells us that yoga is that which brings a cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. So when we're speaking about moving through the limbs, what he's, what he's done is he's described what happens and then he's given us the tools of how to experience this. Because when he says in the, in the second sutra that yogash chitta vritti nirodha, what we, what we know is, okay, so yoga is that which causes a cessation of what our minds usually do, this up and down. But it's not just up and down, it's sideways, it's clockwise, it's counterclockwise, it's, you know, figure eights. It's, it's what, our, what our minds do that unfortunately aren't even as systematic as simply up and down. So it's, it's fluctuations much like an Indian highway is a fluctuation where you've got some people going this way, you've got some going that way, you've got some going this way, some going this way, some going this way. And that's, that's what happens in our minds. So he then gives us actually how to do it. And this is, this is an important point actually to, to stop on for a moment because what it teaches us if we think about it deeply is, I already have yoga in me. Yoga has become something where it's become about more and more certification, more and more certificates, more and more diplomas, more and more degrees. 
But right there in the very second sutra, I mean, right after he has said, okay, now we begin, now we begin talking about the discipline of yoga, the very next thing he tells us is that you've already got it within you. And that the only thing that is preventing you from experiencing it is the fluctuations of the mind, which clearly is not you. And if you can just use the practices to get the mind to be still, yoga is already there, which means, sure, get diplomas, get certificates, why not? But do not think that those are what is giving you yoga. What's giving you yoga is when you can make it still. There's a beautiful, beautiful story of the Buddha being out walking with some of his disciples and they stop to take a rest someplace and the Buddha says to one of his disciples, please go get me some water from that river. So the disciple goes to get water, but at the very moment that he goes to get water, a bullock cart walks across the river and of course throws up all of the mud and the dirt in the river. And so the disciple goes back to the Buddha and says, I'm so sorry, I can't get it for you because the water is too muddy. So the Buddha says, no problem, we'll sit for a while. And after some time, he sends the disciple back and says, now go and get me some water from the river. The disciple goes, comes back again. He says, I'm so sorry, the water is still muddy. Less muddy, but still muddy. Buddha says, no problem. After some time, he sends him again. And by this point, all the dirt has settled back down and the disciple's able to get a, a nice bucket full of beautiful crystal clear water for the Buddha. Brings it back. And the Buddha says, see, it's not that the drinkable water wasn't there. It's just that the dirt had gotten moved by that bullet cart and you simply needed to wait for it to settle. It's not that something happened to that water to make it drinkable. Nobody came in with a magic wand and rendered the water pure enough for the Buddha. You just had to wait. You had to wait for the dirt to settle. And so in the same way, what yoga gives us, it's a more active waiting, you could say. But really what yoga gives us is the ability through how we are with ourselves, how we are in the world, through using the body, through using the breath, gives us a way for that dirt to settle so that we can experience that, that clear, beautiful beautiful water. Another way, another way to think about it is another parable. I think it's a Buddha parable as well of him being in the, in the woods and the forest with the disciple on a beautiful, beautiful full moon night. And they look down at the lake, but there's too many ripples on the lake to be able to properly see the reflection of the moon. And so they wait, and again he says, you know, wait. And the lake becomes clear, and the reflection of the moon is perfect. That it's not, it's not that the, the meditation made the moon fuller or brighter or clearer, but what the meditation did was give time for the ripples on the lake to settle so that they could see the reflection of the moon. And that's really important because these days, a lot of us have taken to a spiritual practice, much like we take to everything else in life, which is, I'm not good enough. I have to work, 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 work. You know, I need to stress. I need to strain. I need to squeeze myself. This is going to be yet another thing I'm not good enough at. And what these teachings remind us is it's within you. The only thing that blocks it 
is these very superficial ripples, whether we say ripples of the mind, ripples of the lake, ripples of the river, whatever. These are just, they're just different analogies to help us understand the mind. My favorite, favorite example of this, which, cello, let us do it, bears, bears repeating for the new year. So, Elise, raise your hand. Thank you. Everybody in a straight line behind Elise, raise your hand. Those of you literally in a straight line behind her, raise your hand. Fantastic. Keep your hands up. Great. So all of you on this side of their hands, you are group one. All of you on this side of their hands, you are group two. Okay? You guys can put your hands down. Group one, raise your hand. Good. Group two, raise your hand. Great. Thank you. So group one, your job is to chant OM. So on the count of three, you're all going to chant OM. One, two, three. Great. Thank you. Group two, your job is to make as much noise as you possibly can. No holds barred. Forget for a moment that we are sitting here in a satsang environment, that it's an ashram, that it's very quiet and yogic. Just make absolutely as much ruckus as you possibly can. One, two, three, go. Great. That, that was perfect. It usually, it usually takes this group a few tries because people, people don't think I'm really serious about making noise. So they kind of go, ah. but, but you, got, you all really got it. So thank you. All right. Now, on the count of three, both groups are going to go together. And then if I raise my hand on your side, it means your side becomes quiet. So if I raise my hand over here, the ohms are going to quiet. If I raise my hand over here, the noisemakers are going to quiet. Okay? Any questions? Great. So on the count of three, everybody's going to go at the same time. One, two, three. Great. Now, did you start going when these guys stopped or were you going from the beginning? Hmm? Could anybody hear them until these guys stop? Thank you. Why? You were chanting home, but while you were chanting home and these guys were making noise, Nobody could hear you chanting Om. Why? Huh, right, exactly. Yeah, this was not a very trick question. <laughs> we couldn't hear them because you guys were so loud. But they were on. And this is, this is my, my favorite demonstration on this teaching. We all, on a spiritual path, were yearning for Om. Right? Metaphorically, we want more Om in our life. Everybody who says, I'm looking for peace, I'm looking for joy, I'm looking for stillness, I'm looking for meaning, I'm looking for fulfillment, I'm looking for spirituality, we're going to call it, I'm looking for Om in my life. I want that experience in my life. That's there. The problem is this is also there. And so the, the practice of yoga, which Patanjali tells us right there, second sutra, is how to quiet this. And when this gets quiet, in the third sutra, he goes on that then this appears. Our true nature appears. 
This is our true nature. It's not this becomes quiet, and so then you become somebody brand new who you've never been, you know. It's your true nature. You simply become who you already are, but who you didn't know, who you couldn't hear, who you couldn't see because of this. And that's, that's what yoga gives us. And then just quickly, without, because I don't want to leave them undone, the eight limbs take us all the way up through meditation and into samadhi. And, and the reason that I wanted to be sure to mention this is that asana, as we always say, it's not the first limb, it's also not the last. You don't want to, to think that just because you've gotten a perfect perfect asana practice or what feels like a perfect asana practice, that that your yoga is done. Yoga takes you all the way into samadhi. So even if you're not BKS Iyengarji who actually experiences all the way up to samadhi in backbend or shoulders down, don't worry about it. Use the back bends, use the shoulder stands, use whatever asanas you're doing to get the body healthy and strong enough so you can sit still for long enough to go into the practices of meditation and therefore to have the experience of, of samadhi, which is that, that union, that I am am that upon which I meditate. The, the lover and beloved and love are one experience. So, you know, in meditation, I'm meditating upon. In samadhi, the lover and the beloved become one. There is no longer a distinction between me as the lover, and you as the object of my love. Me as the small self, uniting with the supreme self. It's just self. And that's, that's ultimately what yoga gives us. And I wanted, lastly, just to, to jump ahead, uh, from the first section to the second section, just for a moment, and to share one more sutra, which for me is something that is, it encompasses and really embodies a lot of the interaction between our asana practice and our life, which is sthira sukham asanam. Now, Literally, that's translated as that which is stable, that which is joyful, is asana. Our asana should bring us joy. Our asana should bring us stability. Our asana should be joyful. Our asana should be stable. So yeah, on a physical level, it means don't wobble too much. Don't strain too much. Don't kill yourself come down out of headstand if you feel your neck collapsing and your heart rate racing. and you know, Let it be stable. Let it be joyful. But what it also means, because in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna devotes several stanzas to describing the asana. Now, Patanjali is speaking about a posture of the body. Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is talking about an asana like this, literally something upon which we sit. And after describing it, he talks about what it should be made of, and he talks about how thick it should be, how thin it should be, how soft it should be, how hard it should be. And after that, he says, once you are established in asana, 
you are ready to begin the practice of yoga. And to me, that's very, very, very profound because it clarifies in a way that nothing else I have read or heard clarifies that asana absolutely isn't yoga or isn't the fullness of yoga. And yet, that it is a crucial part, because remember the Gita 700 stanzas. It's the word of God spoken in the middle of a war. I mean, time is, time is precious. You've got armies on both sides. It's not, it's not you know, sitting over a, a lazy cup of tea on a Sunday afternoon where you have the luxury to kind of ramble. It's an every word is precious time. And in that every word is precious, he has given, given emphasis to the asana and has emphasized that once you are established in asana, now you're ready to begin the practice of yoga. So then we come back to the yoga sutras. Sthira, that which is stable. Sukham, that which is joyful, is asana. So yes, again, we're being, we're given a description of what asana should be. Lord Krishna spoke about it in terms of soft, hard, thick, thin, what it's made of. Here, Patanjali is speaking about the qualities. But it goes much further than that and much deeper than that because when you remember that yoga is the full union, and that asana, because remember these scriptures are not, they don't exist in vacuums isolated from each other. Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is also an incarnation of Vishnu. So when you look at it on the deepest level, that which Patanjali is telling us is being given to us by the same being as what Lord Krishna is giving us in the Gita. So you look from one to the other and we realize, well, all right. So if asana is what we have first, in order to be able to begin our practice of yoga, and asana is that which is stable and joyful and which therefore brings us stability and joy in our lives, and that's what asana is. And then flipping from there into the Gita, once you are established in asana, so merging them, once you are established in stability and joy, you are now able to begin the practice of yoga. So stability and joy and this is where, you know, Puja Swamiji, he, he speaks so frequently about the importance of not complaining, not grumbling on a spiritual path. And he always says, you know, where there's, where there's grumbling, there's no God. That's one of his, his very sweet quotations. Where there's grumbling, there's no God. And I think about that when I think about this because we may call it yoga. But if we are not stable, if we are not grounded, if we are not connected to a source of joy, a source of suk, then it's not, it's not yoga. And so that's where it's important for us as we, as we look at bringing yoga in our lives to really understand it in its fullness. That in order for me to be doing yoga, otherwise, why does my asana have to be stable and joyful? I mean, if it's just for my body, 
what do they say? No pain, no gain, right? I mean, if anybody's ever been in an aerobics class or worked out at the gym, what do teachers and trainers say? Harder, push it, push it, push it, push it, more, more, more. You can do it, you know. Don't let go, don't come down, harder. This is, this is what we get told because ultimately the goal is physical fitness. The longer you hold it, the more calories you burn. Longer you hold it, the more muscle tone you're going to create, unless, of course, you injure yourself. But with asana, as a component of yoga, what we're looking to build is the self, not the muscles. And this is where stability is so important. And the joy is so important. That which is not stable and not happy may still be exercise. But it's not asana. Because asana is a crucial part of yoga. And yoga is that union. And where there is instability, where there's the fluctuations of the mind, which is what leads us to dukkha or unhappiness, the opposite of sukh, there isn't, there isn't union. There isn't the possibility of union. 